there's plenty of room down front. Come on, don't be shy. There you go. like together. Nobody comes. Yeah, the front, we'll be good. We'll be a good congregation. That was Go ahead. Here's another one right here. Is that it? Is there anybody else in there, Jen? We can't tell twice. Don't let anybody leave. This is uh, a baseball story that kind of transcends all baseball. Transcends all baseball stories. The mother of all baseball stories. And it, it gets a sweeping panorama of my life and different people I've met in my life. And as a little background, the Phillies have been in the National League for you know over 100 years. They won the pennant in 1915. After 1915, they just had some horrible teams, really horrible teams. In the 30s, you know, they were the joke of the league. They were worse than the Cubs, the White Sox, people like that, the George. But after the Second World War, in the late 40s, they had a new owner, and he started to get these young players through the farm system, and their team became very good. And in 1949, they came in third place. So in 1950, we had a lot of hopes for this young Philly team. At that time, I was a little kid, you know, with the ear glued to the old Philco, listening to the games. The 1950 season started, and the Phillies jumped out in front. Now, the Phillies had some, to me, some great ball players. Uh, Probably you haven't heard of a lot of them. I'll just name a few. Wakeus, Goliath. Wakeus at first, Goliath at second, Hamner at short, Woodenhead Jones at third. Left field, Del Annis, center field, Richie Ashburn, right field, Dick Sisley. Uh, catching was Andy Semenik. He was older than the other guys. They, called, they used to call him Grandpa. And also catching was Stan Lapata. was a great big mountain of a man. Keep that in mind. That comes in later in the story. Stan Lapata, he's a catcher. The pitchers were, the ace right-handed pitcher was a young guy named Robin Roberts. The, uh, the left-handed ace of the staff was a young guy named Kurt Simmons. Okay. <laughs> the, Phillies, the Phillies jumped out into the lead. And, you know, all of Philadelphia was excited, you know, our team, you know, this looks like it might be the year. There were a bunch of young guys, and the papers uh, gave them the name of the Whiz Kids. They were called the Whiz Kids. Where'd they get that name, Jim? Uh, I don't know. Tell me, Walt. <laughs> I'm a Dodger fan. I hate, the, I hate this story, 1950s. It's a terrible year. Because, the because they were so young. They were so young, they were called the Whiz Kids, and that's true. Randy, uh, Andy Semenik was a little older. He was called Grandpa Whiz. Now, they break into the lead, and along comes, you know, about July, and the Phillies start to put some distance between them and the hated Brooklyn Dodgers. Hated. That's the way it is. Everything's going along smoothly, actually. On June 25th in 1950, disaster struck the country and also the Philadelphia Phillies. The North Korean troops passed the 38th parallel and started the Korean War. And President Truman took the troops that were in Japan, rushed them into Korea to try and hold the Pusan Peninsula. It was a little peninsula, just a little perimeter down at the bottom of South Korea. They were trying to hold on until more fresh troops, could, Allied troops, could come up. President Truman had to call these fresh troops up, and he activated the Pennsylvania National Guard. Now, all soldiers and sailors, you know, they're all precious to their families and to all of us. 
but there was one Pennsylvania National Guardsman that was so precious to us in Philadelphia, that was PFC Kurt Simmons. At the time, uh, at the time he was activated, it was like in, in August, it, was, it wasn't right when the war started, in August he was activated, he was 17 and 8. So he was a, our ace left-handed pitcher. Okay, the Phillies still had a fairly good lead. So we were hoping, well, you know, Kurt's not here, but, you know, Robbie can do the job, and Jim Constanti, and all those other guys. So, slowly but surely, the lead begins to dwindle. And who's making the move on us? Oh, but those hated guys. Brooklyn Dodgers. <laughs> being naive young kids in Philadelphia, air flew to the old Philco, we didn't realize what we were facing. They were just the Brooklyn Dodgers. These guys were the boys of summer. Now, I'll name a few of their names, and you'll recognize them. Gil Hodges at first, Jackie Robinson at second, Pee Wee Reese at short, Billy Cox at third. In the outfield, we had Carl Ferrillo and Wright. We had Duke Snyder, the great Duke in center field. In left field, Cal Abrams. Remember his name? That'll come in a little later on. <laughs> catching and catching, batting in seventh place, get this, this this kind of team it was, camping, Roy Campanello batting in seventh place. That's what kind of team they had. Pitching, the big Don Newcomb, the big nuke, their ace pitcher. So these guys began to close in on the village slowly but surely. Robbie, Doing the best he can, you know, pitching, pitching. The last week of the season, Robbie started five games. The last eight games, Robbie started five. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it must be the great chili in the sky. <laughs> Robbie was trying desperately. Robbie's record at the time was 19 and 11. He was desperately trying for his 20th victory and trying to, you know, put a little distance between the Phillies and the Brooklyn Dodgers. A week before the season ended, Robbie was nursing a 2-0 lead into the ninth in Shy Park in Philadelphia. The Dodgers got two men on in the ninth inning. Up stepped Gil Hodges. Boom. Out into left field, Robbie lost the game. That's, that's the way it was going, you know. Robbie nursing leads and then losing the game. So we get to October 1st, and the Phillies are leading by one game, and there's one game left in the whole season. And it's going to be played in Ebbets Field in Brooklyn against the hated Brooklyn Dodgers. Fate couldn't have made it any better, you know, to bring these two teams together on the last day of the season. So, on a gray, overcast autumn day in New York, something like today, <laughs> a little chillier maybe, <clears throat> the Phillies and the Dodgers are going to play this last game. If the Phillies win, they got the pennant. They win by two games. If the Dodgers win, it throws it into a playoff, and it's a three-game playoff, and here are the Phillies. They're demoralized, you know? I'm still wearing my Phillies. Okay, I'm the Phillies. <laughs> We're demoralized, you know? Kurt Simmons is gone. Robbie's arm's ready, ready to fall off. You know, he's pitching all these games. So it's the last game of the season. Eddie Sawyer, the manager, gives Robbie the ball. He says, Robbie, it's up to you. We expect you to do it. Robbie goes out there and pitches the game of his life. But <laughs> who's he facing? Big Nuke. Nuke is pitching the game of his life, too. In the, in the uh, first inning, the Dodgers make a threat. Pee Wee Reese, there's somebody on base. Pee Wee Reese hits one to deep right center field. Richie Ashburn saves the day, a brilliant running catch. But out of that problem. We go five innings, no score, 0-0. Zero, zero. Top of the sixth, Phillies get three straight hits and take a 1-0 lead. Well, you know, maybe there's hope. Phillies are hit one nothing. Last of the sixth. Pee Wee Risa, Robbie's Wrong making hat. miss me to these guys. <laughs> <laughs> Pee Wee Risa's up, gets an outside pitch, boom, hits it to right field. 
On top of the right field wall is a, an, a fence, acorn fence, like they call it, anchor fence. This ball, no one understands how it happened. The ball hits the fence, boom, comes straight down and sits on top of the wall. The ball is in play as Reese circles the bases, as Robbie, I mean, as Richie Ashburn and Del Ennis stand there in right field looking at that ball sitting up on top. <laughs> this is how Reese hit his home run. And, you know, it was fate, see? And fate, we, I thought, oh, fate's making a mockery of this. But fate was just teasing, teasing the Dodgers. Fate was teasing the Dodgers. We didn't know it at the time. We were down. Okay, we get to no more score. It's 1-1. One, one. Phillies don't score in the ninth inning. Last of the ninth, Dodgers up. If they score, it's all over. What happened to the ball? I mean, it's just sitting on the fence. A couple, a couple innings later, they had a stop play. Some fan crawled out on the wall and got the ball. They stopped the play when the fan got it. But, you know, Reese had circled the bases for a home run. Okay. <laughs> Last of the ninth inning, Robbie's on the hill. His arm is. You know, he's pitched his heart out. He's pitched a three-hitter. Three-hitter, and he's on the hill. <clears throat> he walks the first guy, Cal Abrams. Remember Cal's name. Cal's on first. Pee Wee Reese up, gets a hit. Cal goes to second. We're in trouble. <clears throat> Last of the ninth inning, Dodgers 2-1, none out. <clears throat> Approaching the bat, Mr. Duke Snyder. The Duke of Flatbush. The Duke of Flatbush. They call him that because he used to hit him out on the Flatbush Avenue in right field. So the Duke is up. Robbie's scared. But he says, I gotta, gotta get one by the Duke. <laughs> the Duke is looking down third base. What kind of signal we got here? You know, what do they want me to do? Third base coach is looking into the dugout at the manager. The manager gives him the signal. <clears throat> third base coach says, got it. <laughs> gives Duke the signal. The Phillies are saying, maybe Duke will bunt. You know, move the runners up. The thing about that is the manager, the Brooklyn manager, says, if I have Duke Bunt, who moves those runners up, that takes the bat out of the next batter, who happens to be Jackie. <laughs> you don't want to take the bat out of Jackie's hands. <clears throat> Duke has the sign from the third base coach. Robbie holds the ball. Now, Robbie figures Stan Lapata is in there, and he says, Robbie, you know, the Duke's power is inside high. Keep it low and away. Robbie throws the ball. The Duke swings, and he puts wood on the pill. The Duke swings and hits a shot back through the box. Robbie ducks to keep from getting killed. The ball goes shooting right over second base, a base hit. Obviously, the Dodgers are winning the game, right? Abrams is off at the crack of the bat. He rounds third. The third base coach waving him. Go ahead, Cal. Go ahead. Cal's coming down the line, you know? Hey, you know what we want? The boys of summer come out of the dugout to congratulate Cal as he goes across home plate. But wait a minute. <laughs> Go back a couple of frames before Robbie pitches, and Richie Ashburn's in center field. <clears throat> Richie was a great center fielder. He had one weakness, and that was his throwing arm. So in order to compensate for that, Richie used to play very shallow. He could really go back and get him. He was speed deep. So he played shallow. But, you know, the Duke, he was still playing shallow, even though it was a Duke, and he said, well, I know that's the Duke up there, but I just have a hunch maybe it's coming my way and maybe the Duke is going to hit it low. 
At the crack of the bat, Richie starts charging in from center field. The Duke's ball hits over second base. Boom. Richie scoops without missing a motion. He wings the best throw he ever made in his life down the home plate. At home plate <laughs> is big Stosh Lapata. Stosh takes it on one hop. He stands there 15 feet tall as Stosh Lapata. <laughs> Here comes Cal. Oh, it's an easy run. He sees Stosh and he stops dead in his tracks. Couldn't slide, couldn't anything. Stosh puts the tag on him. Richie has saved the run. <clears throat> they walked Jackie Robinson, took the bat out of Jackie's hands because first base was open. Duke went to second, Pee Wee Reese on third. Base is loaded one out. They still have a chance. Robbie's bearing down now. Who's he facing? The rifle Ferrillo, Carl Ferrillo, the rifle. Known for his great arm, also winner of a batting title. So he could hit. Ferrillo pops to first base, Eddie Wade just gets it. Two down. Who comes up? Gil Hodges. Remember last week, Robbie was nursing a 2 nothing lead in Shy Park. Two men on, Gil hits it out. Okay, who's he facing? Gil Hodges. Gil connects. Robbie gives it to him. Gil hits one deep to right field. Not quite deep enough. Okay. <laughs> Ennis is back. He's got his hand on the wall. Okay, I got room. Ennis gathers it in. Whew. The Phillies are out of the inning. <clears throat> Go to the 10th inning. Phillies get two men on against the nuke. The nuke is now tiring. The great nuke is now tiring. Hard to believe. <clears throat> the nuke tires. Phillies get two on. Up steps Dick Sister. <laughs> the nuke has been giving them inside stuff all day long. And Sisler has three hits on the inside stuff. The nuke says, I'm giving this guy something on the outside corner. Nuke fires it on the outside corner. Sisler swings. Boom. And the nuke had a great fastball. He couldn't get all the way around on it. He gets wood on the pill, way out to left field. Back to the 350 sign goes Mr. Cal Abrams. Ball is into the stands. Dick Sisler has hit a three-run homer. Four to one Phillies. Robbie gets them out in the last of the tenth. In the last of the tenth, the Phillies win the pennant. You can imagine the skinny little kid in Philadelphia. Here glued to the Philco as Sisler hits this home run. Well, we're cheering in Philadelphia. It's the greatest thing we ever heard of. 35 years since the Phillies won a pennant. We were very excited. In the clubhouse, after the game, no woman reporters, so I have to say <laughs> The reporters come up to Richie and say, Richie, how did you know to be right in that spot where Duke hit the ball? Richie says, hey, don't give me too much credit, boys. I was in the right spot at the right time. It worked to my advantage. That's all there is to it. <clears throat> Fast forward 10 years. It's 1960. <clears throat> the whiz kids are all gone. Robbie's still around. Kurt Simmons is like three and six. You know, they're done for. Most of the, the whiz kids have traded or retired. The Phillies are in last place. At this time, the skinny little kid from Philadelphia is <laughs> the quiet little school teacher. <laughs> Teaching American history, United States to 1865. Teaching the high school kids American history. I say to myself, well, 
Whiz kids aren't doing much this summer, last play. I mean, the Phillies aren't. The Whiz kids are gone. Maybe I ought to think about getting a date with somebody in Philadelphia area. When you talk about getting a date with somebody in Philadelphia area, particularly the Frankfurt section of Philadelphia, there's only one person you can be thinking about if you want to go for the top, like the Whiz kids. Go for the pennant. You got to try for a date with Jenny McGee. <laughs> not to try for a date with Ginny McGee, but it wasn't the easiest thing in the world to do, let me tell you. <coughs> she was very, very popular in the Frankfurt section of Philadelphia, probably other places too, I know that. <laughs> very popular down the shore, down Summers Point, all those places. <coughs> we should get to I thought, well, the Whiz kids did it. They went for the top, they played over their heads. They beat the boys of summer. The Whiz Kids beat the boys this summer. Why shouldn't I go for the top? I dialed the number, unlisted number. I had a friend who had a friend, you know. I got the number. <clears throat> I'd like a date with Jenny McGeehan. Jenny had four older brothers. One of these older brothers was George McGeehan. <laughs> they used to take, you know, such good protective care of their sister, their younger sister, these four older brothers, and she had so many phone calls and everything that they used to act as screeners on the phone. <laughs> we didn't have call waiting, messages, anything like that, but they acted as screeners. George McGee answered the phone. Hello. I said, I'd like a date with Ginny McGee. <laughs> he said, well, what's your game, you know? Football, baseball, basketball. Ginny was going around with all these big stars, you know what I mean? She was real popular. What's your game? Are, are you in law school, you know, an engineer? What is it? I said, after some hesitation, George, I'm a quiet little school teacher from Burlington, New Jersey. George says, hold, please. <laughs> He gets off the phone, he gets on in about 15 seconds, and he says, I can work you in. It can't, it can't be a weekend. Weekends are out. He says, there's a Wednesday available, the third Wednesday of the following month. I said, I'll take it. The third Wednesday of the following month approached. I was very nervous. I knew where Ginny lived on Oakland Street, 4635. Came the third Wednesday of the following month. I wear my best clothes. I walked hesitantly up to the door, <clears throat> scared to death. <clears throat> Little did I know that on the other side of that door sat Ginny McGeehan. <laughs> She's saying to herself, you know, going around with these basketball stars, baseball stars, football stars, lawyers, engineers, it gets kind of bored. <laughs> Maybe it's time I settle down <coughs> with some quiet little school. <laughs> precise moment in time, I knocked at the door. <coughs> the rest is history. I have here with me my Ginny McGeehan. I have to at the crowd here my whiz kids. That's the end of my story. Uh, most of you have probably heard about the uh, epic baseball story that Dad told 
relating uh, the 1950s Phillies whiz kids to his life. Um, he liked to say that he played over his head, much like the 1950 Phillies, in uh, winning the hand of the beautiful Ginny McGeehan. He made that phone call to uh, Oakland Street, and the rest was history. He ended up with four whiz kids of his own. Well, there's another, uh, more to that story, and I'd like to relate that to you now, if uh, you'll indulge me. Some of you may know the name uh, Wally Pitt. Some of you may not. He uh, was a solid first baseman for the Yankees in the 1920s. Played 15 years in the majors and hit uh, 281 for his career. Now that's not that's not bad at all. In 1924, Wally Pipp had one of his finest years ever. He hit 295 and drove in 114 runs for the Yankees. Well, one day in 1925, Wally Pipp uh, decided he needed a rest, so he went to the manager and said, "Skip, I don't think I can go today. I need I need a rest." Well, uh, little did he know that waiting in the wings was one Henry Lewis Gary. I'm sure you all know the name Lou Gehrig. The Yankees had some idea that Gehrig would be a good ball player. He hit 500 in his 10-game appearance in 1924 after a September call-up. Well, after replacing Pip on that fateful day in 1925, Lou Gehrig went on to hit 295 with 20 homers in 126 games, and that was it for Wally Pip with the New York Yankees. He got traded to the Cincinnati Reds in the offseason. Gehrig went on to play in 2,130 consecutive games. He hit 493 home runs and hit 340 for his career. That's Hall of Fame stuff. Gehrig earned himself the nickname, the Iron Horse. Well, fast forward to 1959. The beautiful Jim McGeehan is indeed quite popular in the Frankfurt section of Philadelphia. <laughs> He's going around with a very nice fellow named Jimmy Hawk. Some of you here may even know Jimmy Hawk. He grew up in Holy Child Parish. He went to St. Joe's Prep and St. Joe's College. Was really uh, quite a nice fellow. Well, in this story, Jimmy Houghton is Wally Pitt. <laughs> <laughs> Little did he know that waiting in the wings was one James Valentine Mallory. <laughs> After making that fateful phone call to 4635 Oakland Street to ask for the date with the beautiful Jenny McGeehan, he played 48 consecutive years. <laughs> he was our iron horse. And like Garrick before him, he was humble. In fact, I think Garrick's speech on July 4th, 1939, nicely sums up the life of James Valentine Mallon and the life that he gave us. And the quote that I would like to leave you with from that speech is, I feel like the luckiest man on the face of the earth.